All right, I had to start over because my silly dogs were barking up a storm. And uh, so I'm reading The Sacred Romance. This is actually one of my favorite chapters so far just because of the imagery in this chapter. And um, I really, I really, really liked it. I read it to my home group too. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. Got to get it all in the right, get it all situated. All right. The unknown romancing. What or who first calls to us from the wellspring of our heart? Our external stories, the ones we live in front of the world, filled with busyness and bustle, will not give us the answer to our question. We must move to the internal story that goes on in our heart. If we're going to begin the journey towards the recovery of our heart, we must follow Frederick Buckner's advice and listen to our lives. If God speaks to us at all other times through such official channels as the Bible and such, then I think that he speaks to us largely through what happens to us. If we keep our hearts and minds open, as well as our ears, if we listen with patience and hope, if we remember it at all deeply and honestly, then I think we come to recognize beyond all doubt that however faintly we may hear him, he is indeed speaking to us, and that however little we may understand of it, his word to each of us is both recoverable and precious beyond telling. Our inner story is the most audible early in the morning, or sometimes in the middle of the night, when the inner editor that tells the tells us how we should respond to the world has gone off duty. It is then that our heart speaks to us of the story that is most deeply ours. It is a story whose plot contains both mystery and magic as well as foreboding and anxiety, what philosophers call angst. When we listen most attentively to the inner story that our heart tells us about, most of us are aware that the plot revolves around two very different messages or revelations that have vied for our attention since we were very young. One has enchanted us while the other has dared to rise above fear and resignation. The first has come to us in the form of romance of a romancing that even now in my forties often fills me, Brent, with anticipation. Something wonderful woos us. The other lays siege to us in much darker hues and brings with it a foreboding that sometimes nags at the edges of our consciousness, even on the most sunlit morning. Something fearful stalks us. And yet life's enchantment of us is, perhaps, the deeper of the two messages, the love story that first engaged our heart before the darker revelation did its work. And so it is here we begin to listen to our lives. If we will allow ourselves to go back to the story most of us knew as children, it is not hard to bring back the early images and sounds and aromas of life's first revelation, that of a great romance. Each of us has a geography where the romance first spoke to us. It is usually the place we both long to see again and fear returning to for fear our memories will be stolen from us. My own earliest memories of the romance came from 120 acres of New Jersey farmland, bordered by a stream to the southeast and a low and broad hillside to the northwest. As was the case with most family farms in the 1950s, the labor of both my mother and father was required by the animals and the fields from early morning to dusk, leaving my sister and me to explore the mysteries of meadows and haymows. I first remember the romance calling to me when I was a boy of six or seven, just past dusk on a summer evening when the hotter and dustier work of the farm had given way to another song. Something warm and alive and poignantly haunting would call to me from the mysterious borders of the farm that was my world. I would walk toward it, past the corrals where our milk cows rested, down through rows of dark green corn that towered far over my head. The corn, imperious in its height and numbers, presented its own kind of enchanted forest. Every leaf that gave way before my outstretched arms offered possible mystery. The earth was warm and brown and fragrant and seemed to invite a sort of barefooted ecstasy with no worry of stones or other debris to cause me harm. Finally, I would come to the end of the corn out 
into the fringe of meadow where tall grasses swayed in silvery response to the moonlight's embrace. Beyond these dancers, a thin line of maple and oak trees, straight as sentinels, hid the voices calling so passionately to me from moving water where the creek formed the border of our farm. The hardwoods that guarded the creek would usher me to a sandbar below an old wooden bridge that carried the road above onto the New Jersey rich farmlands. There in the moonlight, I would squat down on my heels near the water's edge, letting my toes sink into the cool sand. Around the imprint of my foot, the sand would bleed the deep reds of resting iron ore. In that place, I was in the middle of the singers. The voices of crickets, katydids, and cicadas would come, in, come to me, carried above the sounds of the creek and mingled with the pungent odor of tannins. Tens of thousands of streamside musicians sang to me the magic stories of the farms and forests. It seemed as if the songs were carried all the way from the headwaters, those mysterious beginnings of water that came up through the mosses and cattails in a manner no less magical than if they'd been called to life by moon-dusted fairies. The creek waters would rest in the darkness under the bridge before continuing their journey. The surface stillness of the resulting pond played host to the shiny green lords of the young river, the deep-throated bullfrogs. They added their own intermittent bass notes to the melody, a call to order unheeded by the grass of musicians. I remember being in that place until the music of life would fill me with the knowledge of some romance to be lived, an assurance that there was a reason to joust against dragons with wooden swords, a reason to wear not one but two pearl-handled revolvers in the cowboy stories I weaved and lived out each day. A reason to include a pretty girl who needed to be rescued, even though I was far too busy fighting the bad guys to be captured by love. The magic assured me of loves and lovers and adventures to be joined. The romance of that place would surround me as I rose and returned through the cornfield in response to my mother's distant call. It comforted me with a familiarity that seemed to connect me with things that were at once very old and still becoming new. Lying on my bed with my parents far off downstairs in another part of the house and a geography of the heart that I didn't then know, I would fall asleep romanced by some unseen lover that back then I knew only from those singers the summer moonlit night. I perhaps, like you, have encountered the romance many times since, in the golden fall of the Rockies and in the windswept sea grasses and white caps of bay. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> Sorry about that. I, perhaps you, have encountered the romance many times since, in the golden fall of the Rockies and in the windswept sea grasses and white caps of bay and ocean on the Atlantic, in quiet moment of sunlight orchestrated into parallel rays of warmth on my shoulder as I read a good book, in the eyes of certain women and the strength of certain men, in the joy of my five-year-old son turning cartwheels during a soccer game, oblivious to the demands of winning, and in rare occurrences of kindness, courage, and sacrifice by men and women I have known and reports of the same by many I have not. In my adult years, it has ebbed and flowed and usually comes as a surprise. One vivid appearance took place perhaps four years ago on a summer's evening. A couple who were longtime friends of ours before we moved to Colorado were visiting us from the East Coast. It was a difficult time for them individually and for their marriage. This particular night, the four of us had gone to see when Harry met Sally a poignant comedy drama on the subject of whether men or women could just be friends. The movie provoked much emotion in our friends, and they walked down to the lake near our home to talk about their hurt and anger and their future. Our house sits on a ridge in the southern portion of our city, and my wife and I sat on the table in our darkened living room, looking out at the lights of surrounding neighborhoods. I felt heavy and sad inside over the pain of our friends, heavy about the unknown future of their marriage and our friendship, sad as well about some of the distances in our own marriages that, marriage that had rarely been bridged. 
As I put these things into words with Jenny, she reached out and took my hand. I don't remember the exact words of our conversation, but I remember her sitting there in a summer dress with her blue eyes visible even in the twilight. I know we talked about being a man and being a woman and what it was like to love and to be in love. I felt as if some veil that was often suspended between us fell away for a few moments and we talked as friends, friends who had the possibility of deeper romance. I remember going to bed that night feeling much the same as I felt as a boy on those summer nights so long ago, stirred and enchanted by a taste of beauty and intimacy that came by surprise. The tears I shed in the moments before sleep were sad and joyous and felt not at all contradictory. When I awoke the next morning, I reached for that sense of romance inside, but I knew it was gone before I even went into the kitchen for coffee. The veil had dropped back into place, and the day before me seemed to offer only the everyday responsibilities of job and family, and simply going on. Remember, I realized that I had found part of the lost journey of my heart, and as a young boy, my heart was captured by mystery, mystery that invited me to open my heart and join it in a kind of joyful exuberance, mystery that hinted of a story that existed on its own outside my fanciful creations, a story that nonetheless invited me to be part of it as I constructed my childhood adventures, a story that offered me villains and heroes and a storyline that evolved out of their conflict, a story that along with telling me of great danger, also told me that all things would be well. A story that felt as if it began in laughter and was confident that it would bring all who were a part of it home in a joyful communion. Sadly, many of us never came to see this wooing in whatever geography it first finds us as having anything to do with our own heart's deepest desire, our spiritual life, or our soul's destiny. This is true in part because it is a story that is very hard to capture in propositions. We've learned to tell it ourselves that it is naive. We have learned to tell ourselves that it is naive to trust it after we become adults, as if somehow we have outgrown it and moved on to more reasonable or scientific ways of thinking. We have learned to think of it as a quaint or sentimental or as the foolishness of a child. Contemporary Christianity has often taught us to mistrust it for, f for fear it will lead to some new age heresy, unwittingly giving away what most deeply belongs to Christian faith. We are certainly rarely told to listen to it, look for it, follow it to its source. Thankfully, our heart will not totally give up on the romance. In spite of our maturity or the admonitions of our teachers to avoid the things of the world, we find ourselves with a lump in our throat at a movie when two lovers we know are meant to be together finally find each other, or don't. Another movie tells us of a story of a man with a noble heart. He sacrifices comfort and safety for a higher cause than mere political expediency. He is defeated, yet his spirit enthralls us with his heroism. We leave the theater with a burning in our heart, a desire to be part of such a cause. In all of our hearts lies a longing for a sacred romance. It will not go away in spite of our efforts over the years to anesthetize or ignore its song or to attach it to a single person or endeavor. It is a romance couched in mystery and set deeply within us. It cannot be categorized into propositional truths or fully known any more than Studying the anatomy of a corpse would help us know the person who once inhabited it. Philosophers call this romance, this heart yearning set within us, the longing for transcendence, the desire to be part of something larger than ourselves, to be part of something out of the ordinary that is good. Transcendence is what we experience in a small but powerful way when our city's football team wins the big game against tremendous odds. The deepest part of our heart longs to be bound together in some heroic purpose with others of like mind and spirit. Indeed, if we reflect back on the journey of our heart, the romance has most often come to us in the form of two deep desires, the longing for adventure that requires something of us and the desire for intimacy, to have someone truly know us for ourselves, 
while at the same time inviting us to know them in naked and discovering ways lovers come to know each other on the marriage bed. The emphasis is perhaps more on adventure for men and slightly more on intimacy for women. Yet both desires are strong in us as men and women. In the words of friends, these two desires come together in us all as a longing to be in relationship of heroic proportions. When I was a boy, I loved to jump from our hay mow onto the backs of steers feeding at the hay rack directly underneath. The ensuing bareback ride was always an adventure of the highest order. I also loved to watch the Mickey Mouse Club on television just to have a moment's intimacy with Annette Funicello. I am still partly convinced that our eyes met a time or two and she smiled at me. These two boyhood passions for adventure and intimacy often came together in my fantasies in a story in which I would rescue Annette from the bad guys and escape with her into the mountains where we would live happily ever after. I would be her hero. She would be my beauty. And we would always be ready to fight the bad guys again whenever the world needed us, side by side. Whatever form each of our intimate adventures has taken in our fantasies or in real life, this sacred romance is set within all of our hearts and will not go away. It is the core of our spiritual journey. Any religion that ignores it survives only as guilt-induced legalism, a set of propositions to be memorized and rules to be obeyed. Someone or something has romanced us from the beginning with creekside singers and pastel sunsets, with the austere majesty of snow-capped mountains and the poignant flames of autumn colors telling us of something or someone leaving with a promise to return. These things can, in an unguarded moment, bring us to our knees with longing for this something or someone who is lost, someone or something that only our heart recognizes. C.S. Lewis knew this longing well. Even in your hobbies, has there not always been some secret attraction which the others are curiously ignorant of? Something not to be identified with, but always on the verge of breaking through. The smell of cut wood in the work workshop or the cl clap clap of water against the boat's side. Are not all lifelong friendships born at the moment when at last you meet another human being who has some inkling, but faint and uncertain even in the best, of something that, of which you were born desiring, and which beneath the flux of other desires and in all the momentary silences between the louder passions, night and day, year by year, from childhood to old age, you are looking for, watching for, listening for, you have never had it. All of the things that have been deeply ever, uh, all of the things that have ever deeply possessed your soul have been but hints of it, tantalizing glimpses, promises never quite fulfilled, echoes that died away just as they caught your ear. But if it should really become manifest, if there ever came an echo that did not die away, but swelled into the sound itself, you would know it. Beyond all possibility of doubt, you would say, here at last is the thing that I was made for. We cannot tell each other about it. It is the secret signature of each soul, the incommunicable and unappeasable want, the thing we desired before we met our wives or made our friends or chose our work, and which we shall still desire on our deathbeds when the mind no longer knows wife or friend or work. While we are this is. If we lose this, we lose all. Indeed, art, literature, and music have all portrayed and explored the romance, or its loss, in myriad scenes, images, sounds, and characters that nonetheless speak to us out of the same story. The universality of the story is the reason Shakespeare's plays, even though they speak to us from a pastoral setting in England across 400 years of time, speak so eloquently and faithfully that they are still performed on stages from Tokyo to New York City. It is as if someone has left us with a haunting in our innermost, in our inner heart stories that will not go away, nor will it allow itself to be captured and ordered. The romance comes and goes as it wills, and so we are haunted by it. What does this romance have to do with God? Could it be that the more literal, 
propositional message of Christianity that we recite to each other in the Apostles' Creed is the same secret message those singers were sharing with one another and with me on those long summer, long ago summer evenings of left us with the haunting of this sacred romance to draw us toward home. If this poignant longing were the only deep experience of our soul, then we should not lose heart. Though we may not have tasted satisfaction yet, we would search for it all of our lives. There are enough hints and clues and tantalizing glimpses to keep us searching, our heart ever open and alive to the quest. But there is another message that comes to all of us in varying shades and intensities, even in our early years. It often seems to come out of nowhere and for no discernible reason that we can fathom. It is dark, powerful, and full of dread. I think of it as the message of the arrows. And that's the title of the next chapter. Um, I apologize for all the distractions today. My dog's barking, my alarm going off, craziness. But this was a great chapter. I love the imagery. I hope that you can listen to it without uh, all the distractions bothering you. Uh, have a good day. Love my friends. Bye.